I will attempt to moderate this discussion and I'm going to ask first we're going to cover some of the questions that were raised with paper uh, written down and if anyone needs a reminder this is Hugh Sher, our lawyer a uh, local lawyer from Toronto Dr. Ramona Coco from London Alex Schadenberg from EBC Bob Park, local Toronto bioethicist, and Albertos, Polizagopoulos. And I'd ask the speakers as well, since you all have a microphone, speak directly into the microphone so we can hear your responses. We'll start with the first discussion, uh, which someone raised. A lot of this debate has centered around doom, more gloom, kind of the negative of obviously what uh, is implicated when we're discussing euthanasia and assisted suicide. What are some positive responses, if you can each speak to this, uh, that citizens, concerned citizens, can move towards as a collective in response to these issues? How can they take a proactive response and a positive approach to this issue? And how is the best way for them to combat this in a form that relates to them as a collective, but also as individuals? Well, first of all, I, I, working? First of all, I'd like to congratulate Kathy. She pronounced Alberto's name properly. I'm probably the only one in the room who could do so. Uh, okay, I think we're all people who are being realistic but of great hope. I, I heard Bob's presentation on, the, uh, on his hospice model, what he's working on. That gives me great hope. This is something that uh, should be done and should be done in communities all over Canada and hopefully all over the world. Uh, but this is the kind of thinking that we need. Um, in my reality, I also talked in my presentation about compassionate community care, trying to help people make decisions, but also the reality is, is that uh, we can change the world if we wish to. If we wish to be, uh, the, how would you say, signs of hope to others, if we wish to help people in their lives, to be there for them in their time of need, we can change the world. It's, it's just a reality that the world is looking for uh, signs of hope. And we need to provide that. So I have great hope, but the reality is, is I don't think we should hide what's going on in the world at the same time. So I, I, you know, I, I want you to know the truth, but I also want you to know that we have a, a collective responsibility to be with others, because in fact, people who are choosing euthanasia or choosing to have their doctor lethally inject them, which is a better way to say it, are people who are people who are going through a terrible time in their life and are feeling they have no, no hope. They have no further purpose, and that's a very sad reality. Okay? And it, yeah. Can we take the response from everyone? Yes. I think, um, Alex, you said what I would want to say, that providing um, good palliative care. Um, I, we were chatting just a few moments ago. Uh, um, for me, palliative care can also be a very privileged place to be. If, if done right, it can actually be quite a beautiful thing. And so I want to encourage people to uh, be uh, advocates for palliative care and give hope to communities in that way. Yeah, I don't know if we can top what Alex said. I think, you know, what one thing I'm guilty of is not necessarily uh, vocalizing the recognition of the person uh, that is considering assisted suicide or euthanasia. The reality is, as Alex said, they even, even the people who come to this voluntarily are vulnerable. Uh, some of us might say they're victims. They're obviously in a very desperate situation. Uh, and although I'm up here waving my hands and talking very loudly about uh, conscience rights for healthcare practitioners, we do need to start, uh, or at least continue to be uh, cognizant of what they're going through and try and be compassionate. And I think Ramona also answered it for him. She talked about her patient, right? The patient and how you were with that person and you were just caring and they, in the end, decided to die a natural death. I think that gentleman who asked me a question, I'm not sure if he's still here, really hit home with his statement that we need to spend time with people. We need to address their death wishes. We need to be not afraid to try to find solutions for them to love and accompany them. And I think on a positive note, what I was also saying is that I've met so many wonderful people this year, really wonderful everywhere. Um, I even get letters in my office from people wanting to support me and what can they do to help. What a beautiful show of solidarity. And if we could continue that, like Alex said, in a community level, with our neighbors, with our confreres, then we can spread 
what I think is our narrative, because I think our society has taken on a very negative narrative, and also a negative perception of, of our story, which I think is the true story. <laughs> um, so we have to be willing to talk about it and engage. I agree with everything that's been said now. The question is then how to effectively operationalize those things. How do you operationalize hope and meaning in people's lives as you move forward and travel with them through this, uh, through this amazing journey? And I guess a couple things I would submit to that is that, number one, uh, we need to ensure that the, the institutions are in place to enable that, whether that is uh, ensuring fundamental access to hospice and palliative care, whether it's ensuring a meaningful ability to access health care across the country, whether it's ensuring and creating a dialogue that secures you know, uh, an ability to access both access to supports in the community when one is living in the community and needs those supports, uh, which are huge problems uh, today, uh, whether it's ensuring that our long-term care facilities have and are equipped to appropriately deal with the challenges that people confront with vulnerability and or near the end of life, and to ensure that we have in place those kinds of uh, social mechanisms and, and institutional mechanisms to be able to respond meaningfully and proactively. I've always said for 25 years, nobody should be forced to suffer to death or kill themselves. Those should not be our options. And too often, those are the options that people feel that they are left with. And to the extent we can change that equation, we may well be able to at least shift to some extent the cultural ethos of the moment uh, back to an ethos that, that values more meaningfully life uh, hope and the ability to, to move forward as part of a community. Thank you. Great. So our next question is directed to Dr. Ramona Coco. Uh, are the provisions for conscience rights for medical professionals, for example, abortion contraception, are there, sorry, are there provisions for conscience rights for medical professionals, i.e. abortion and contraception? If so, could they be applied to euthanasia? So actually, it's the opposite. In 2015, um, a policy that came first before euthanasia was legalized uh, changed the human rights policy for the CPSO, saying that for any issue, including abortion and contraception, uh, that we have to make an effective referral. And Albertus was talking about that when he was saying that, in fact, this is increasing gatekeeping, that those poor doctors in Ottawa, um, where they had a sign and uh, it was a big deal, but now we have to make an effective referral, so they have to wait hours, see the doctor, find out we don't agree. Apparently, we have to send a referral and someone else has to do it. So actually, um, the precedent started with uh, everything else in 2015, and then when euthanasia or medical aid in dying was legalized, a new policy came in just for that, saying the same thing, that we have to make an effective referral. In some circumstances, for everything except euthanasia and assisted suicide, uh, the physician may have to provide or prescribe the drug or procedure themselves. Um, now, there's ambiguity as to whether that applies to assisted suicide. In the court case that it, we argued, the college said they didn't. But the policy is ambiguous on that. Actually, um, David Roussel, who's the head of the CPSO, uh, did an interview with CBC a few days ago where he said that uh, self-referral is fine. So for birth control and abortions, if do patients can seek it elsewhere, they don't need a referral. So he contradicted his own policy. But the policy uh, stands. Thank you. This question is directed to Alex. What do you think is the main reason that physicians are willing to administer legal dosages? Are there any possible interested are there any that are possibly interested that could be associated with them carrying out euthanasia? So I guess the question is... What is the main thing that makes, uh, has a doctor want to be involved correct. in this? I think it's philosophical. Doctors are, for the most part, not wanting to be involved in this. For the most part, doctors uh, view their training as uh, caring for their patients, uh, treating their symptoms, making sure that uh, they're uh, dealing with uh, a patient's actual needs. So most doctors are not willing to participate, even though it appears that most doctors will actually refer. Uh, nonetheless, most doctors who are participating, it's because of a philosophical point of view. They've decided that euthanasia is a good thing for whatever reason. Uh, maybe, uh, but, and, and they've come to the point of view that they think they're doing something wonderful and good. There was a recent article in the London Free Press. There's only two doctors, as Ramona said, and it was probably from her comments, probably based on that London Free Press article, 
which had the one doctor being featured in it. And he travels all over southern Ontario doing euthanasia and everything. And he says there's only two doctors willing to do it. He's even gone out to Windsor and that to do it. Leamington or something too. And things like that. Uh, and it appears that he's just philosophically, this is his thing. Eh? I'm, I'm euthanasia doctor. I'm, I really believe in this. This is a wonderful thing. And, and I can't explain it further. It's a worldview. Okay. Anyone else want to offer uh, maybe for a moment? Do you have any no no? Okay. So this is a question that uh, either of you could answer. Um, I would, like to, I would like to engage with my local politician on this issue. What are two to three pieces of proposed legislation or other issues under the purview of my MP and MPP that I should discuss with them? I think that's a question for Harold Elbrick. Um, <laughs> one of the two things that should be talked to with the MP or MPP. The funny thing is though, I think that we have experts here in all the areas because there's a couple of questions at hand right now that are still being dealt with and that's conscience rates, etc. cetera. Uh, but um, Harold, do you have any thoughts? He's shaking his head no, he's hiding away, he's saying please, I'm just here as a participant. You might want to comment. Yeah. Anyone else? I think uh, some of the most fundamental questions relate to access to palliative care and also access to appropriate hospice care and quality health care and supports within the community. Uh, you can talk to Alex, I guess. Suicide prevention is another one. But the, reason, the thing I'm thinking about is to the extent one wants to argue that assisted suicide is a constitutional right, one could equally argue, frankly, just as strongly, that the deprivation of access to quality palliative and hospice care in the presence of an assisted suicide option is in fact the violation of a constitutional right. And that's, I think, an issue that may actually see, see its head raised in, in time to come. Uh, just to follow up with that, uh, in 2011, there was a, a committee that uh, I co-chaired on palliative and compassionate care. And we made the case there that uh, Canada needed to do a much better job. So it's not simply a matter of going to your MP or MPP with negatives. Like, I'm against physician-assisted suicide. I'm against abortion. What are some ways that you can go to your MP or MPP with positive alternatives, whether it's promoting adoption and the abortion situation, or promoting palliative care, like I mentioned just a few minutes ago to Bob Clark. I think these are ways that you can show that you are compassionate and you want to make a positive difference. You're not simply negative against things that are coming down the pipe. And that we definitely have to be against some of them, whether it's legalization of recreational marijuana or safe injection sites. There's all kinds of issues that we can have a voice on but let's find ways that we can be positive in our messaging to our MPs and MPPs. Fantastic, thank you. Yes. Uh, hello, I'm uh, here as the chair of the Faith and Witness Commission of the Canadian Council of Churches. And um, I can inform you that uh, about half a year ago, the commission, uh, by consensus, and this means it represents about 85% of Christians in Canada, um, formed a um, declaration, I guess, uh, advocating on theological grounds um, that uh, palliative care was the solution to these problems. And all, at the same time, because Charlie Angus approached us for some uh, advice and assistance, we were able to add to this the idea that it was, in fact, a, char a charter right on the basis of the theological arguments. Uh, what makes this rather interesting, I might add, uh, is that uh, the Canadian Council of Churches is a consensus body, and 15 years ago, uh, all 25 member churches reached an absolute consensus against euthanasia. And when C14 came out, uh, in the warm up to C14, we took up the issue again, and to my great surprise, I might add, um, discovered that the churches are now somewhat divided on this issue. And we're talking about mainline churches in Canada, I won't name names, but um, there were a number of churches that argued strongly in favor of uh, the assisted suicide option. And it's important to remember that this is a theological commission. These people were not just leading hearts or uh, going for the autonomy issue on some kind of romantic existentialism, but uh, saw it as an issue of real compassion 
So right at the moment, uh, it's a deep theological question that's being debated, and yet both sides participated in this consensus that pal therefore palliative care was the way to go. Um, and uh, this document is online. If you go to the website of the Canadian Council of Churches, you'll find it. Um, and it's also gone to members of parliament. Um, for me, this is rather exciting because it's extremely rare that uh, uh, people doing the kind of fabulous work you've done, this has been a wonderful day, uh, people doing the kind of fabulous work you've done reach out to theologians or even to the religious community for support in the debate. Um, and um, there could be considerable value there. Uh, the decision to end somebody's life is the decision that they're already dead. And that's not, as Dr. Kello said, that's not really just a medical decision, right? That's um, a potent decision that takes on, takes on the authority and power of God. And therefore, really, it would be a help, I think, to have a group like the Canadian Council of Churches as part of the dialogue. So good for Charlie Angus, and um, I hope it'll continue. This. In Canada, what constitutes the decision-making capability of the patient for this law? Did you catch that? So in Canada, what constitutes the decision-making capability of the patient for this law? Why would depression not viewed? Why would depression be not viewed as questionable competence? If a patient were refusing treatment and had debil dehabilitating depression. Wouldn't we stabilize the depression prior to having treatment stop? So I guess this is a kind of a compound question. Maybe uh, Dr. Ramona Coppel can respond to that. Well, there's two things there. Um, I agree that uh, when someone is depressed, by definition, they are suicidal. And so uh, good medicine would say that that should be treated first. Psychiatrists will say, and I think there was someone in psychiatry mental health nurse, um, that yes, you can still be depressed and be considered competent. And so you have a, a differentiation of groups of some psychiatrists who say, well, that uh, a death wish from a depressed patient always needs to be treated. This is not something that would, um, would be a, 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 a request that's reasonable. On the other hand, they might still be competent. And then the second part of the question, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting already. Okay. Um, I if think the you're actually better to answer that as a bioethicist, correct? Sure. Um, so about, about the issue of capacity, and I'll mean, please jump in too. Um, in Ontario, in Ontario um, we've tended to sort of defer, incorporate, um, what is it, Section 4 of the Healthcare Consent Act. Um, does the person understand and appreciate? Now, the, the, the law in terms of uh, medical assistance in dying, it doesn't quite apply there. And I know one of my colleagues did a paper and looked at the different capacity tools and found that there was 26 capacity tools that people use. And now, people don't use any one particular tool. They may use an amalgam of those tools to determine if somebody is capable. But this is a very profound decision. As um, we heard earlier, it's not you know, like a gallbladder. You have the surgery in your... your uh, wait to talk about it afterwards. This is a very significant decision. So I don't know if there's an easy answer to capacity, but I think we tend to incorporate um, the Healthcare Con Consent Act in Ontario and our capacity assessments. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't know. You might have something to say too. Uh, the reality is the, the legislation doesn't set out a test or a analysis that a doctor has to go through. It simply says two physicians need to say that this person qualifies one of the elements of qualification is capacity. Capacity might be viewed differently or interpreted differently based on different doctors. I, you know, we're going to we're going to have a situation where capacity is retroactively challenged, but the damage at that point is done. Uh, 
I'd like to ask you, do you see um, medical aid in dying as a treatment that falls under the Health Care Consent Act and the uh, test of capacity under the HCCA is applying to this kind of decision? Where I, where I would start is that the issue of consent uh, serves as the basis for all medical decision making. And to the extent that the concept of consent is being applied here relative to uh, assessing uh, both the willingness to have and the capability to have uh, medical aid in dying, then to that extent people will attempt to read it into the provisions of the, the Health Care Consent Act. At this point we don't have a clear definition within the Act, so there's no clear determination, but if one applies basic principles of medical consent and extrapolates that to the concepts of uh, medical aid and dying, then one can come to that conclusion. There's, a, For example, in Quebec, the pro province of Quebec has uh, legislated the area of medical aid and dying as part of its health care jurisdiction. And there's an ongoing challenge still in Quebec relative to whether or not the province in fact has the capacity constitutionally to actually uh, legislate this area because historically it's fallen under the criminal law power of the federal government uh, because it's historically been criminalized. Now to the extent that it's no longer criminalized, one it raises the question, given the limited circumstances as described by the Supreme Court of Canada, whether or not that can be incorporated under the provincial jurisdiction around health care and whether or not the pr principles relating to legislation around health care and health care consent would apply. I think the general prevailing view culturally and socially is that yes, that's the way it is and should be conceived. I don't agree with that. And I think most people on this panel probably would not agree with that. I, I, I still view the issue of t intentional taking of a life as contrary and antithetical to the basic principles of health care. But it seems to me that the province of Quebec and, and perhaps those on our Supreme Court of Canada, depending on what happens with the case in Quebec, may come to a different determination. So I think that's an open question, but I think the... I'd like to add on to that. that is there a strong legal argument that medical aid in dying is not a uh, treatment under the Health Care Consent Act? Because the HCCA only applies in part one to treatment decisions, and if this is not a treatment decision, then the HCCA does. We still have the common law issue of consent, but are we outside the HCCA? The, 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 the definition of treatment, though, under the HCCA is so broad. I mean, it almost encompasses anything that's sort of curative, treat, uh, palliative, uh, uh, of so many different varieties that it's hard to, if, if one accepts the ruling of the Supreme Court of Canada to the effect that the purpose of medical aid and dying is to provide a level of uh, of, of curing of of, um, of uh, suffering, then that would fall within potentially the Health Care Consent Act. And I think another case that we were involved in was the Razuli case at the Supreme Court of Canada with EPC. And that was to some extent one of the issues being addressed both by the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court of Canada was to what extent does this issue of consent and the Health Care Consent Act and the assessment of best interests of the patient under the Health Care Consent Act enter into the, the equation in terms of determining when a health care treatment plan could effectively be uh, used to deny and deprive the ability of doctors to effectively withdraw uh, a form of treatment that had previously been offered and agreed to. Well, I think um, the HCCA includes a therapeutic purpose as one of the elements of a, of a treatment, if I'm not, not mistaken. Yes. And so if they would include dying as a therapeutic purpose, uh, then it would arguably come under the HCCA, which I think is a a big problem once we start having uh, uh, medical aid and dying as as a, as as a actual treatment. So I think this discussion to me is is important, but it, it misses the sad point of the law. The law doesn't even get into that point. In an Ontario bill that was done to, uh, how would you say, have the Ontario law and the federal law connect together, that Bill 84, they didn't even deal with that question per se. It did not put it under saying that assessments will be done in this, didn't touch it. And so essentially the law says uh, one doctor will decide and the other doctor essentially, or nurse practitioner, will, uh, will approve what the first doctor has decided. Essentially this is what we have. And when it comes down to uh, assessing someone's capacity, we have a difficulty here because it's uh, a little bit wide open. But then if you heard my presentation earlier today, even if the person were to make a decision, the doctor were to make a decision to do euthanasia on someone which is technically incompetent, all the doctor would have to say is, I thought they were competent, and they'd be fine, because the law was written in such a way to cover them. So 
even then, even when there was a mistaken decision, the law covered them. So why even worry about it? Sadly, no one's being protected under the law that the government gave us. Does anyone have a question from the group? Okay, I don't want to be hogging the mic and everything, but I'm going to stand up because I feel like I have my back to some people. Okay, so one thing like that I don't know if anybody talks about in this euthanasia um, debate is what happens when we die? And I don't want to get all philosophical or anything, but does anybody who, and I'm not saying that people do, people go through tremendous suffering. My mother died of cancer. I understand that. I'm not, not, not the, to lack compassion, but do people even think about what happens when they die? Because people and our society in general that doesn't believe in God anymore think that we're just like animals and when we die, that's it. But what if it's not? What if that's not it? And what if the way we exit this world and all that stuff matters for the next life? And I know um, the, the gentleman who works with the churches, I was surprised because a lot of people who are Christian understand that this life is a gift and all that. But... Um, it just kind of made me think because people, like, do people even think about what happens when we die? Because what, like, I don't mean to repeat myself, but what if, like, what we do in this life and how we choose to die and when we end our life is going to have an impact on the afterlife? And even if you don't believe in Christianity, like, that could freak you out, you know? Like, you could want, you, I don't know, because I know I myself have gone through, like, depression and stuff. And when you think about, okay, well, if you end it, it's all over. Well, what if it's not over? So maybe that's not even a, something to discuss, but do people even think about it? And how about we ask people who are dying, like, what do you believe happens when you die? That just might get them thinking. Okay, sorry if it's completely irrelevant. Come. No, no, that's good. And Dr. Gallagher, when he was the speaker last year, addressed that question in detail, actually. And his position is actually posted on the DeRubber in, uh, Institute website, and I think he would really enjoy it. Um, but what he's, oh, and it's, is it's it also in featured in our most recent newsletter here that you can pick up copies of. It's on page uh, two, and it addresses some of the concerns that he raised in terms of uh, doctors and their response to this. Well, and, and what he's saying is that, you know, uh, in this debate, it's been very unfair um, in a sense that religious people, we're not allowed to argue on religious grounds, and we are under increasing scrutiny by the public to justify our positions and often they're saying well you can't you you can't validate that that's just your little beliefs about the about the, the sacredness of life about life after death and yet um, the secular uh, people who are postulating that made is a a better thing to do is in that death is better than a life of whatever circumstances are also making a metaphysical judgment in the sense that uh, no one, like I, I said in my talk, no one has, uh, no, none of us have died. And so, yeah, that's a good point. Why not, if I could just address that very briefly, and that is to say that the constitutional framework within which this, these decisions are operating still garner the, the uh, constitutional charter rights to freedom of religion and freedom of conscience as being of quite significance uh, within, our, within our law and within our, our cultural ethos, even though it's often been you know, sort of subrogated, put down relative to other more secular values. Having said that, the other aspect with regard to euthanasia and is suicide is that as people will say, it's still a choice. People don't, not everybody is required to effectively end their lives by euthanasia or assisted suicide. So to the extent that it doesn't comport with your particular view of the world, your particular religious beliefs, and your particular values, then it's not a choice that effectively should be imposed upon anyone. And it's not a choice that somebody should be obligated to, to effectively carry out for themselves. So the issue is, how do you balance those competing constitutional uh, principles, both in terms of the, the freedom of conscience and religion, the right to choose for yourself what's best for you, on the one hand. On the other hand, the, the obvious subtle pressures that society often puts upon people and, and the impact that has upon us in terms of making day-to-day -day decisions in our lives, even in this, this healthcare context.
Sure. That, that's a good point. And I think it's a good point to make like on a societal level like Dr. Gallagher is making. But I, I don't think that it's the best um, or the most sensitive way to approach a patient who's suffering and thinking about death. So you're not wanting to increase their guilt. Or Just a couple of experiences that I'm aware of. Um, Thank you. I have this soft voice, and I guess I have to be reminded to speak into the microphone. Um, <laughs> there was one um, young woman who had asked for medical assistance in dying in our hospital, and she um, had been away from church life for some years, and she didn't know that, um, and she came from a Catholic perspective, she didn't know the church's position, and then when she was asking for medical assistance in dying, she was actually asking for the sacraments uh, prior to, to death, and when the chaplain came up to, to see her, and to explain to her, you know, the Catholic Church's position on this, it rather upset her. Um, like, what do you mean the priest won't come and see me? And so, it, it was, so she was contemplating it, but in the end she still said, well, I'm going to have it as my choice. Then others have been more along the lines of, when this life is over, it's over. It's my free will, that's the end of it. I want to end my suffering, done. We also have another question. In terms of nurses, um, yes? Okay. Yeah, and I'll just raise this after this point. Uh, are there any nurses in the group that would like to address or highlight their position on how they've experienced the ramifications of the legalization of assisted suicide in Canada? I have to say I'm concerned about this from a conscience perspective, but I have no direct clinical experience about it because it's not legal generally for my patients unless they have a terminal illness as well. So I work with people with schizophrenia and uh, their families and teams. So I know it's going to affect teams, whether they have a position on this currently ahead of time before it's legalized for our patients, which I think is inevitable. Uh, but also people may participate and then later decide, I can't do this again. You know, it'll have an impact on them. So I can't speak from a medical nursing perspective. Yes, yes thank you. Clinical? Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Agnes, and I'm actually a palliative care nurse, and I came here because uh, tomorrow one of my home care patients is going through my eight. And this is my second patient, so this is affecting me on a personal level. And uh, it's affecting our team. We have a very strong palliative care team in Cambridge, and most of our nurses are very strong um, on this position that palliative care is to support patients towards the, till the end of their natural life. And MAID has no room in palliative care. And we are really surprised that MAID is actually making its way and it's overshadowing us. As soon as this mate is being asked for, it's like we are overshadowed, so we are not able to do this palliative care anymore. Um, so the way it's affected me is I had to excuse myself um, for the second time as soon as I learned that evaluation was being done and this patient was going through arrangements and was going to have this done. Um, and uh, our college is allowing us to refuse ourselves uh, for conscientious objection and our employer was very supportive of this. So this is where we are right now. I don't know where this is going to head. I know hospice nurses are more protected because they don't have this. And hospices, um, they don't have to deal with this, not yet at least. But uh, for us in home care, it's, um, it's, it's starting to affect us. The younger nurses are confused. They don't know what to think about this. Um, I think they're a bit more open. Um, but for us older nurses, um, it's, uh, it, this is not palliative care and we will never accept it. And I think some of us will leave early um, if we are being forced to accept this mate. Thank you. Yes. Um, given that uh, what has happened so far with MAID and the experiences of other countries in the world taking from that, what is the, your, in your opinion, and anyone please, the prognosis of conscientious objection? Well, 
conscience objection will survive, but whether legally it will be supported is really the question that we're waiting to hear on from the courts. And um, my opinion is that these ideas are not new about this idea that whether life, uh, whether terminating life or not is a possibility. Other cultures have done this like age old, right? And then the Hippocratic Oath kind of reaffirmed that this is a dangerous thing to do and reaffirm that we're going to protect all life equally. So I expect that with time and with people like Alex and all these people doing their good work, um, that good people will rise up and conscience subject and hopefully society will change again. Okay, you asked about conscience objection in particular and, and I think it's like a fundamental issue that we have to be involved in making sure that that's upheld. If it's not upheld, I think there's a, a lot of um, blocks that will fall. Why am I saying that? Uh, because obviously speaking, uh, there's older physicians who clearly will never be involved with euthanasia. They believe it's wrong. They were, they were trained in such a way that, that that was an anathema. And so to be telling them to do it now or to be referring, uh, they're older, they'll say, well, I don't need the money anymore and I'll just have to retire. There's younger physicians who will say, well, you know, I can go to the U.S., I can be a doctor there, there's lots of sick people there, I can practice my, my, uh, my trade as a physician that I've been trained to do and I love to do, and I can do it effectively there and yet my conscience won't be challenged, and we're going to lose them. So this is an essential thing for us in Ontario to uphold conscience rights. If it doesn't happen, uh, if in the end uh, the courts make a, another stupid decision, uh, there'll be other blocks that will fall, I'm saying, and that's a problem. As for this whole issue in general, I'm a person of hope, but I recognize that the culture is not very good right now. And I, and I really do challenge people to say, well, how do we change the culture? The culture is, is changed by the people who are in the culture. And it's not a short-term thing, it's a long-term thing. Uh, but we will always say no. We will always be upholding that this is not, uh, not only is this not medical treatment, it's never acceptable to be involved with killing people. This is, uh, and, it's, uh, and uh, to me, as I say, this is, uh, this is a lie. It's not about my, true, my, my autonomy, that's a joke. It's about someone else in the law having the right to kill me, and it's never a good thing. Sure, yeah, I, I don't have much to add. I think, I think uh, Alex is right that there's two things here. There's conscientious objection, and conscientious objection protection, protection for conscientious objectors. Uh, obviously the protection is now in flux and at the heart of these legal challenges so we're not going to know for a few years. I think the law's on our side and I think we ought to win from a legal perspective. We'll see if we will. Uh, but let's assume for just one minute that we lose. Uh, it goes all the way to the Supreme Court and we lose. And none of the legislatures legislate this. I think what may happen as a result of that is we'll start to see uh, a chipping away at conscientious objection itself. Because as Alex said, conscientious objectors will just leave. They'll go to different provinces or they'll go to different countries or they won't go into medical school or they'll retire or they'll, they'll choose other uh, specialties. Uh, and the sad reality is some people will compromise. And so within a generation or so, maybe two, maybe three, we simply won't see those conscientious objectors anymore. Because those who have the the uh, conviction not to engage in certain procedures or acts will either not get into medicine or be thrown out. And I'm hoping too that institutional conscientious objection, we can continue to find ways to uphold that and support it. I wanted to speak to the wonderful nurse who just spoke before your question, Rosanna, and say how much that um, our hearts go out to you in terms of support. And I know that when we've gone through these issues, we've had to make sure that we've had a team of support around each other because it has been very heartfelt um, and I don't ever want to undervalue the 99% good work that's going on that you're involved in. This 1% feels yucky and so wherever you can find your support for you and your colleagues, please do so. And I would urge you not to leave your work because somebody like me wants you as my nurse, right? That's what I, I want. I want Ramona as my doctor. We have one more question. And we'll keep Bob too, but anyway. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, euthanasia affects medical profession professionals in a special way, but it also will affect the rest of the population in a different way. Uh, so I'm not a healthcare professional, but what would you suggest to the rest of us? You know, we're, as we leave the symposium tonight, are there three things that you would suggest that we do to somehow um, make a positive change easily? Like when we go home, uh, when I'm talking with my family members or friends, what do you suggest that I say to them or do or whatever? Thank you. Yeah, I'll say something real quick. Uh, and I say this just because of uh, personal experiences. Tell your uh, family members who are el elderly or disabled that uh, they are not and will not be a burden because I think that's where this is going. Those people will think they're a burden and will choose this. So that's what I would suggest. One other thought in keeping with that, I think there's an important role for advanced care planning and have discussions around what your wishes are because some people may not know that they don't have to be a, a burden, they don't have to be an ICU with all these other kinds of uh, treatments. So there could be a place where, um, okay, if my heart is failing, my breathing is failing at the end stages of a disease, um, this is what I want. So advanced care planning is, is also very important. The other kind of number two that I wanted to speak to is join our journey for a hospice. Encourage it, support it, however you can do it in your own communities. That's what I would add as number two. Okay, so there's a lot of great people here. You mentioned about advanced care planning. Uh, contact the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition for our prior attorney document. Uh, it, it is what you need. Um, the other thing is, is that uh, we have to recognize that if you have, and this is just very, very practical, because all the political stuff, whatever has to be done, I don't know if the Weber Institute even wants us to talk about that because they're not political, but the point of it is, is uh, um, you have neighbors, you have friends, you have people you know, spend time with them. They, uh, you'd be surprised how many people in your life who you know are um, going through a difficult time and need someone who's supportive. And uh, you can't talk to them all the time, sometimes you just listen, but they need someone with them. Uh, the other thing you can do is, um, uh, Dr. DeVeber is the name brand of the organization. His book, Berries at the Back, and they've got a few of them, uh, buy one of those so that they uh, sell it and read about Dr. DeVeber. Thank you. Yes. We have another, is there another comment to make for this? No. Okay. Dr. Yes? Just a quick comment, yeah. Yeah, I think the most, uh, one of the most important things is to ensure that you speak with your family members about what their express wishes are mm -hmm. relative to a host of different healthcare situations as they end towards the end. As I explained earlier on, in terms of the importance of express prior wishes and clarity and specificity in those wishes, it's very important. The second thing I would say is that, as Alex has indicated, it is important to the extent possible to try to document these things through proper legal tools like powers of attorney for personal care or living or, or, or other kinds of documents that will set out your values, your beliefs and your directions to your decision makers in a in time when you're no longer capable of making those decisions for yourself. Okay, and I'll just clarify that in my mind, living wills are really imperfect tools. Life rarely plays out the way a living will kind of runs. And it's much more important that you have somebody who knows your values, like Alberto shared that story, or someone shared a story of a patient who chose their niece instead of their children. Mm -hmm. Someone who understands their values so that no matter what happens, that they can make that decision. So that's the power of attorney for personal care. And actually, Alex's is great. The EPC site one is excellent. Fantastic. Under, under that, I tell people everywhere I speak, never, never just appoint your, your eldest daughter or your eldest son as your power of attorney. Because when people make up their power of attorney documents, it's usually done with their will and everything, right? So they, someone has to make these decisions and be, often it's just the oldest daughter or oldest son. And I always say to people, when it comes to your health care and, and decisions with your uh, personal care needs, appoint someone who shares your values. That's exactly what Ramona just said. It's so important. It's ridiculously important. Um, what happens to your money, it doesn't matter if you're dying anyway, but what happens to your, um, what happens with the healthcare decisions is fundamentally important. Thank you. We have another question. Right, so a thought about um, nurses, for example, who are um, dragged into these situations and, um, you know, and then recuse themselves uh, and other unwilling members of the medical profession. You know, we're entitled, if you're part of an institution, to trauma care. Right? 
So why not raise this as an issue amongst the providers of trauma care paid for by the insurer of your institution saying, I need trauma care and I need trauma care from somebody who shares my point of view and thereby raise awareness within the, within the institutions that um, you know, there is another point of view. My, my second comment is just about to carry on with the idea of conscientious objection. So there's conscientious objection and there's respect for it and then there's actually paying the consequences of conscientious objection which has happened over the years for war resistors and others which is perhaps losing one's property, going to prison, etc. And um, of course none of us would like to do that but really that is what conscientious objectors have done in uh, times of um, you know, high, uh, when the stakes were very high shall we say. So you know, is there a way in which that kind of like um, civic action could be uh, could be organized around someone, a um, medical professional perhaps, who is, you know, who finds themselves under disciplinary action. <clears throat> so how do we, you know, not just talk about conscious objection, but actually, actually live it and be prepared to pay the consequences. And maybe, who knows, you would, people would come out of the woodwork to say, well, I don't agree with this person on, you know, I don't agree with my family doctor on this issue, but, you know, he or she has done so much for me in other ways, um, you know, you have to do something about this law. So, thank you. Yeah, just a uh, great comment. I, I uh, have said a number of times, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, uh, this issue of conscience rights for physicians, all it would take is 200 doctors in Ontario to send in a letter to the college saying, we are resigning because of this. Uh, and then you get those 200 doctors to hold a press conference at Queen's Park, mm -hmm. and they simply say, you know, I have 612 patients and I'm leaving, I have 308 patients, and then the story becomes not 200 doctors have left, but 50,000 patients just lost their doctor. Uh, That's right. And if we had that, overnight it would be changed. But you start rounding up 200 doctors that are prepared to put it on the line. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. We have another question. Just a comment on what we can do when we go back into our everyday lives. Um, for those of you who have um, pastors, uh, priests, uh, faith leaders, um, go and have a chat with them. See what they're, how they're feeling and what they are thinking and how you can help bring this information uh, and the issues of of um, pastoral care and support. Uh, there's a lot that we can do. Um, the call to, to Christians, to the church, uh, to educate our um, friends and colleagues in, in the church. So that's my comment. Thank you. Do you have another question or comment? Kathy, can I just go yeah. uh, um, I want to say how valuable it is to have our chaplains in the places where I work to help deal with the moral distress that inevitably comes with this kind of work. Thank you. Uh, could you comment on what a unionized nurse should do and what a nurse with religious objections should do in terms of the human resources accommodations angle in an, if they're still employed, like before they quit? Can I just ask you to repeat the question? Uh, so there are two things uh, for with religious accommodation. What should a nurse do before quitting on a uh, conscience objection issue? So what should they do with their human resources department in, in terms of asking for religious accommodation? That's one part. And the second is if they're a union member, what should they do before they quit? Don't quit. Yeah, I would. I agree with that. Don't quit. I, I mean, one of the main things I also do is labor and employment law. Um, and the one thing I would say to that is that, number one, under the Ontario Human Rights Code, there are express uh, protections relative to uh, various rights, including the rights for religious freedoms, and there are rights of accommodation under the Human Rights Code that require employers to make certain accommodations uh, for religious liberties in order to enable people to continue at work in ways that are respectful of those considerations. Um, and secondly, there's also charter guarantees, of course, for for uh, government relation act actions, whether it's actions governed by certain uh, conduct that's relating to hospitals and other government uh, institutions, if you will, under the charter. So either way, there are tools available 
So the first thing I would suggest to you is number one, two, if you're unionized, and most of the healthcare practitioners do tend to be unionized, the union is sort of the one with the primary exclusive jurisdiction as the representative for its members. And so technically the union does have the primary obligation to assert and represent its members, both in the context of any suspensions or any discipline or in any um, uh, deprivation of rights of employment. And in that context, if there is any of those things, then one does have the ability to grieve under the terms of your collective agreement. And the union has the requirement to effectively carry that forward on your behalf. They don't have a requirement necessarily to take it through to arbitration. But uh, to the extent the union doesn't represent you appropriately or in, as you deem it, then you could potentially individually file your own human rights complaint. And there's also possible ability through the Ontario Labor Relations Act and the Ontario Labor Relations Board to bring what's called a duty of fair representation application under Section 74 of the Act, which basically is an application that seeks to compel your union to represent you fairly. In other words, the union can't can't uh, act in a way that's arbitrary, discriminatory, or in bad faith in its decisions around representation of you. So to the extent they haven't taken all due diligence, they haven't taken appropriate steps to assist and represent you, that's an option available. Having said that, 95% of those cases, those applications are unsuccessful. Um, so if you're going to do it, it's helpful to know to get with somebody who actually knows what they're doing with it because they're very difficult. Don't quit and call you share. Here, here. Thank you. I do. I mean, in addition to my work on end of life issues, I have spent the last two years as the chair of labor and employment law for the Ontario Bar Association. So these are issues that I speak about and talk about to lawyers and, and HR people across the country. Uh, and if I can be of help, please let me know. But more importantly, make sure you know your rights. Make sure you work with your union to the extent they'll work with you and recognize you also have individual abilities through the Human Rights Act and the Human Rights Code of Ontario to take steps to address your concerns. This is a very important issue. I think even the suggestion was made of having a workshop for nurses, I think is very think valid done, and important. Yeah, okay. So, I, I, I thank you all. Thank you all. Uh, stay, stay, stay. We just want to thank you all, and thank you for the fantastic questions. Um, we'd like to thank the amazing team from Wycliffe College, and um, in particular, Steve, Terry, and Mike, but all of Wycliffe College. Thank you. As you know, everything was taped today live, and it will be available on YouTube to watch in perpetuity. And so this is a way to share the news, to spread it out to others, to share um, and educate and empower people. And uh, thank you so much for making this available long after today. And Bob just said we should thank everyone for spending their Friday afternoon and evening with us together. So again, thank your neighbors. Thank you all for being here. I'd like to introduce Elaine Drake. She will be closing our evening, and we really um, welcome Elaine because she's going to be working in the Institute because somebody's having a baby very soon. <laughs> Thanks very much, Martha. As Martha said, I'm Elaine Drake, and I'm very pleased to be taking over this role for one year from Kathy. Um, and speaking of Kathy, a big thank you needs to go to her. She worked so hard to put this event together. She has worked so hard for years to keep the Dever Institute going and to make it a great success. So Kathy, thank you. Another big thank you to Martha Crean, who has worked tirelessly. You know, a lot of presidents are very distant with their organizations. That's not Martha. She's constantly on the phone. She's constantly involved. She'll do anything. So thank you, Martha. You made this possible. And of course, again, thank our expert speakers. Our summer students have been incredible doing pretty much any sort of job we ask them to do. And of course, again, to you, the participants. And that brings me to a final, very pleasant task of asking you to donate to the Weber Institute. We love doing events like this. These events are really important. Many, many years ago, before I had my family, I became involved in the Weber Institute and it was because um, I really found it was a wonderful place to continue my learning. I had finished my MA in public policy, but wanted to continue to be involved you know, in the public debate about issues like this. 
And it's wonderful that the DeVeb Institute puts on events like this where intellectually honest conversations and debates can happen. So I really thank the DeVeb Institute. I'm really pleased to be a part of it. And I ask you to financially contribute to it. You have donor cards that we handed to you when you first came in. Um, we are asking um, if you can make a one-time donation, that's wonderful, but we'd really like to increase um, the number of our monthly donors. So if it's a smaller amount that you can contribute on a monthly basis, that helps us enormously because we can plan in advance then for events like this and even research for books such as It's Not That Simple. So thank you once again, and I'm really looking forward to serving the Institute this coming year.